Yes, looks great. Great. Okay, so uh, we were trying to make a new catalyst here, and we were just using oxidation reactions um, as a test bed uh, for this. And let me see if go. There we go. Uh, so who was working on this was he was a previous postdoc here, uh, Crystal Riley. He's now staff at Sandia. Uh, that's me right there in the middle, and then Abaya Date, who is, he's our chair of our department right now. And most of the funding uh, for this type of stuff comes from the DOE. Uh, we may get other type of, say, Sandia funding, but that was further down the road, and that was after we actually did a lot of this stuff. So uh, just to show you the problem, uh, currently when you have an industrial catalyst or a catalyst that takes on harsh conditions, uh, you tend to lose surface area. And you want surface area when you, had a cat, when you have a catalyst or else it doesn't work. So this is just a, an example here on the left. This is methane reforming. Uh, you can see the heat is over 650 degrees. Some people can go up to 900, 950. Uh, with steam, many, uh, very, very harsh. So then you lose your surface area. On top of that, say you put a another metal on top of your support, uh, that could form particles and lose its surface area as well, or make other reactants or products uh, going through your stream. So in this case, it will make carbon and maybe deposit that carbon and that will deactivate your catalyst. So if you look at the chart on the right, this is typically what happens. Uh, you see the time on stream is on hours, but uh, big industries want things that work for months or years at a time. That way they don't take them out or stop uh, the reaction that's taking place. So you can see af after maybe a week, uh, they lose most of their activity. So what we were trying to do is keep the catalyst stable as well as keep the uh, added metal that's on top or in the support uh, stable. So one way to do this we found was using a sol gel synthesis method. Now, typically sol gel uses um, an additive and then you put in another reactant and then you can uh, get this nice uh, high surface area support. So if you go down in the pictures below, what we needed was ionic uh, nickel in our case. Uh, it could be ion different types of ions, uh, but we didn't want particles. And we wanted to main this surface area, both the dopant that's going in, as well as that Syria support uh, that's supporting everything. So in our process, we actually didn't have any liquid or solid waste. In some other sol gel um, synthesis methods, you will get liquid or solid waste or have to add uh, other dopants. So this is just uh, what we did. So we actually used PVP, which was uh, easy to work with. I think they even put that on M&Ms or something, so it's not that toxic. Uh, but if you add PVP into the system and just dry it, and then you calcine it or take it to say 500 degrees in air, you'll get a good uh, homogeneous sample and you'll get nickel dopants or nickel atoms uh, homogeneously spread out your entire support. And so what you're doing is you're sticking your Syria uh, precursor in along with your nickel precursor, then along with the PVP, and it actually attaches uh, directly to these different precursors, and it makes the sample uh, distributed like this. And then when you take it to higher temperatures, it basically burns off the PVP, and you're left with this nice uh, support. So some of the advantages of this, of course, is if you have a nice homogeneous structure and you can keep your high surface area, you can put in a large amount of dopant loadings. So say if I wanted to put 10% nickel on top of a serious support, it would make very large particles. And then after getting treated to high temperatures, they would be even larger. Uh, but in our case, it actually keeps them inside. Uh, there are chemicals that we use. We didn't have any solid uh, or liquid waste. So the only waste I would say you have is maybe CO2 when you burn off your PVP, and that just goes up and out to the atmosphere. And it's real easy to automate. It's just basically mixing, drying, and then heating. So that didn't take too, uh, too long either. So again, uh, we found that we can have different selectivities based on the dopant that we were putting in. Uh, I didn't have any activation, so we didn't have to, a lot of people have to do say reductions or 
uh, have weird degreenings or some type of uh, pretreatments before they can get their catalyst to work. And ours just worked as is, going straight into the reactor. Uh, even under redoxing, uh, reduction conditions, we still uh, kept single atoms on there and it was very highly active. So if you just look at the, again, if we were trying reforming here, uh, we were trying to make energy, so H2. Um, so we've taken this even further now. So we've mixed uh, methane with CO2 and we actually got good conversion and selectivity for this using this type of uh, catalyst. So right now, a lot of automotive people need this because they want to reduce the amount of emissions that they're putting out, but also reduce the amount of precious metals that they use. Typically, a three-way converter can have uh, platinum, palladium, and also rhodium. Um, all of those are, say, a platinum is $1,000 an ounce, uh, palladium is double that, and rhodium is very expensive, $20,000 an ounce. But say you would use nickel instead, that's around or less than $20 a pound compared to an ounce. So trying to go to uh, um, less expensive metals is always a plus. So like I said, no, for the market, it's not just automotive uh, right now. If you look out, if you're driving south and you see those, uh, those big machines pumping oil or you see uh, those flares burning off methane, Maybe we can take that methane, mix it with another greenhouse gas, with this, which is CO2, and then make hydrogen energy out of that. So that's one of the things. And since the catalyst is not that expensive, maybe we can make it mobile and put it on a truck or something, and a little small plant, and take it over there. And again, we can, we can reduce the amount of precious metals. This is um, just some data that we had come up with here, or we had run. And this is CO oxidation. So CO oxidation is one of the tests that you use uh, that automotive people like to see. That's one of the toxic gases that comes out of your car, internal combustion. Now, if you look at just Syria as a support, if you go to 300 degrees, you're still left with close to 70% CO coming out of your car. But if you start to dope it with different metals, here's just a sample of what we have done, nickel, copper, iron, manganese, we can actually shift it down to 100% to even get what they call the T90, 90% uh, conversion as low as 132. And if we compare it to a commercial catalyst where they just put on one weight percent platinum on Syria or uh, even more um, on alumina, we still beat that and we're just using nickel, which is fantastic. The other thing is people still need, or companies still want to have, say, uh, platinum or palladium on top uh, of their support or need it, say, Syria by itself. But we found that if you dope your Syria first, you're actually to, you're able to maintain single atoms along the surface of that added metal that you put on. So if you just look at the top portion, you can see um, has, as we make it, just the platinum on a Syria, and then if we reduce it, it gets really active, but if we expose it back to oxygen under high temperatures, it deactivates again. And this is what happens in the figures here, A and B. You have single atoms of platinum, uh, but afterwards you end up getting particles and the seria changes as well. But if you have a doped uh, support, which is something like nickel, you can see the activity is pretty constant and we never actually make any particles. So everything stays single atoms. Uh, which is great because then we can keep the activity that we wanted and we don't have to use as much metal because it, it stays dispersed. So currently right now, uh, we were going through all the patent stuff and of course everyone had questions. So we had to answer the questions, do some more uh, studies on it and then send it back. And then I think that's under review again now. And we had to make um, some more samples. So when you're doing collaborations, say with uh, uh, Umicor, which is in Belgium right now, they make a lot of uh, tons and tons of catalysts. So we have to make uh, more than just say a gram that you would in a lab, we have to make, you know, tens of grams. And they like to have it for themselves so they can put it through say a car engine or high temperature or steam or something like that uh, under their own conditions. We were able to publish on this. So if you guys want to read more about it, uh, here it is on uh, AppCat B. And we have some other related uh, topics to this too. I think they're all labeled on this, uh, this paper as well. So 
But if you do have any more questions, you can contact me. We always like to collaborate with everybody, especially if you're just looking for a material. Like I said, um, that was just for Syria, but uh, we do have it for uh, Lumina, um, spinels, other types of things. It's just like baking a cake though. Each one has its own little recipe and we usually don't share it, <laughs> but, uh, but we can do it. So, uh, but that's it for me. Does anybody have any questions?